Genocidal Maniac or Loving Creator Exploring the Nephilim Controversy Time and time again, atheists and agnostics have brought the railing accusation against Yahuwah and his word. The God of the Old Testament is a genocidal maniac. He arbitrarily destroyed many nations in the Old Testament for no apparent reason. He surely is not a God of love. The following passage is often quoted to substantiate this outlandish accusation. Here, Yahuwah commands the Israelites to utterly destroy the seven nations of Canaan. When Yahuwah thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when Yahuwah thy Elohim shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 to 2. To the casual reader of scripture, Yahuwah's command here seems impetuous and unreasonably harsh. How could a loving father command the utter destruction of entire nations? Scripture states clearly that the Canaanites' infectious idolatry was an underlying reason, but there is more here than meets the eye. To understand the bigger picture, we must back up to the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6 holds the key. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of Elohim came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 2 and verse 4. The true meaning of this passage has long been buried and is often overlooked by scholars and Bible students alike. To unlock the meaning of this passage, we must first determine who the sons of Elohim are. Sons of Elohim in the Hebrew is B'nai Ha-Elohim. This phrase is found in only three other passages in the Old Testament. All three of these occurrences are in the book of Job. Now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan came also among them. Job chapter 1 verse 6. Again there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan came also among them to present himself before Yahuwah. Job chapter 2 verse 1. Then Yahuwah answered Job out of the whirlwind, and said, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of Elohim shouted for joy? Job chapter 38 verses 1 to 7. In each and every passage, the author of Job makes abundantly clear that the sons of Elohim are angels. What then is Moses telling us in Genesis chapter 6? Plainly stated, Moses is saying that angels cohabitated with earthly women and that their offspring were giants or Nephilim in the Hebrew text, Strong's H5303. As outlandish as this may sound to some, this is what the text says. The strange events recorded in Genesis chapter 6 were understood by the ancient rabbinical sources as well as the Septuagint translators referring to fallen angels procreating weird hybrid offspring with human women, known as the Nephilim. So it was also understood by the early church fathers. These bizarre events are also echoed in the legends and myths of every ancient culture upon the earth. The ancient Greeks, the Egyptians, the Hindus, the South Sea Islanders, the American Indians, and virtually all the others. Now let us examine the larger implications of this understanding and how it relates to the Father's command to destroy the nations of Canaan. 
Father Yahuwah decreed the eradication of the Canaanites because they were completely contaminated with Nephilim genetics. This was contrary to his plan for humanity, which in the beginning was created in his image. If left unchecked, this genetic contamination would have become so ubiquitous that it would have made it impossible for the Messiah to be born pure and without blemish, which was an absolute requirement if he was to atone for mankind's sin as the sacrificial lamb of Yahuwah. If the father had not intervened by way of Israel's sword, all bloodlines would ultimately have become polluted with the Nephilim genes. All hope of salvation through the promised Messiah would have been lost. Because scripture does not mention a second instance of angels cohabitating with women, and because the Nephilim resurfaced after the flood, it must be deduced that the Nephilim genetics somehow survived the flood. All things considered, it was most likely Noah's son's wives who carried the Nephilim genes and passed them on to some of their offspring. While this proposition might come as a shock to many, it is the most reasonable deduction based on the chronology of Genesis 6 and the details of the post-flood record. Let us examine the order of events validating these conclusions. 1. Fallen angels mate with earthly women. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim, angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Yahuwah said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants, Nephilim, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of Elohim, angels, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4. 2. As a consequence of the angelic incursion mentioned in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, man's heart becomes inexorably entrenched in evil thoughts. And Elohim saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented Yahuwah that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Genesis 6 verses 5 to 6. 3. Yahuwah says that he will have to destroy man from the face of the earth. And Yahuwah said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Genesis 6 verse 7. 4. Noah is said to be genetically pure. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahuwah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with Elohim. Genesis 6 verses 8 to 9. The word translated as perfect in this passage is tamim, Strong's H8549. In context, this word appears to be a reference not just to Noah's conduct, but to his genetic purity. The Passover lamb and the red heifer, for example, were to be tamim, without physical blemishes, as were all sin offerings. See Exodus chapter 12 verse 5, Numbers chapter 19 verse 2, and Leviticus chapter 4 verse 3. 5. Noah begat three genetically pure sons. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis chapter 6 verse 10. According to the book of Yasha, Noah took one of Enoch's daughters as a wife. Noah went and took a wife, and he chose Nama, the daughter of Enoch, and she was 580 years old. And Noah was 498 years old when he took Nama for a wife. Yasha chapter 5, verses 15 to 16. 
Given Enoch's unassailably righteous track record, it is reasonable to conclude that Noah's wife, Enoch's daughter, was genetically pure and consequently so were Noah's sons. 6. It is stated that the earth and all flesh had become corrupted. The earth also was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 to 12. 7. Yahuwah says he will destroy all flesh. And Elohim said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Genesis chapter 6, verse 13. 8. Noah is instructed to build an ark. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Genesis chapter 6 verses 14 to 17. 9. Scripture mentions Noah's sons' wives for the first time. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. Genesis chapter 6 verse 18. It is critically important to note here that Moses makes no mention of Noah's sons' wives until after it is clearly established that all flesh had become corrupted, Yahuwah says that he will destroy all flesh. Noah is instructed to build an ark. This strongly suggests that Noah's sons' wives were not genetically pure. They were likely carrying at least a trace of the Nephilim gene. This is evidenced by the following facts. The giants re-emerged after the flood without a second angelic incursion. Noah was genetically pure and the contextual evidence suggests that his sons were also. There was no mention of the wives until after it was stated that all flesh had become corrupted. The book of Yasha corroborates this understanding by telling us that the wives were not chosen until after the ark was built. See Yasha chapter 5 verses 33 to 35. 10. Yahuwah floods the earth and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. Genesis chapter 7 verses 23 to 24. 11. Giants, or Nephilim, re-emerge after the flood. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, Yahuwah blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Moving on to Genesis chapter 10, one can become a bit lost in all the generations of Noah. However, it is imperative to note the descendants of Ham, in particular his son Canaan. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. Genesis chapter 10, verses 15 to 18. Now we fast forward to Numbers chapter 13, where Yahuwah spoke to Moses and instructed him to send men to search out the land of Canaan. This was their report. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, Nephilim, the sons of Anak, 
which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Numbers chapter 13, verses 29 to 33. Note that the nations of giants listed here are all Canaanite nations, meaning they are all descended from Noah's grandson, Canaan, and are the ones that Yahuwah commanded Israel to utterly destroy. While only four of the seven Canaanite nations are mentioned here by the spies, it would have been understood that the remaining three were included as they were part of Canaan. It is likely that the spies did not mention the Girgashites, the Perizzites and the Hivites by name because of the route that they took when they spied out the land. The spies came in through the wilderness of Zin in the south and then proceeded northward as far as Rehob. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob as men come to Hamath. And they returned from searching the land after forty days. Numbers chapter 13 verses 21 and 25. While the Canaanite nations were not the only nations of Nephilim, they were by far the largest and collectively occupied more land than any of the smaller tribes. 12. Yahuwah tells Israel to destroy the Nephilim nations. When Yahuwah thy Elohim shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when Yahuwah thy Elohim shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 1 to 2. The Father's command to destroy the Canaanite nations was anything but arbitrary. Far from being a random act of genocide, the annihilation of the Canaanites was a remarkable act of unparalleled providence and selfless love. Had Father Yahuwah allowed the Nephilim nations to continue unimpeded, the entire earth would again have become corrupted and the bloodline of the promised Messiah would have become polluted, making it impossible for mankind to be saved. It makes perfect sense why Yahuwah may have allowed microscopic genetic codes, i.e. a remnant of genetic information, to survive just long enough for his people to wipe them out. Why? Because it was through the heroic acts of the Hebrew people that the whole post-flood world came to fear them, and Yahuwah, their Elohim, the one true Elohim of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Yahuwah got the glory through his chosen people and this new nation of giant slayers stood as a testimony to all other nations of the awesome power and truth of the living creator of heaven and earth. A great example of this is Rahab's plea bargain with the two men Joshua sent to spy out the land of Jericho. And Rahab said unto the two men, I know that Yahuwah hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how Yahuwah dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites, that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our heart did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For Yahuwah, your Elohim, he is Elohim in heaven above and in earth beneath. Joshua chapter 2 verses 9 to 11. When you consider what this tiny nation did to entire cultures of massive post-flood giants, it is very easy to see why Yahuwah allowed Nephilim genetics to survive, long enough to be wiped out by his people. In doing so, Yahuwah demonstrated to the world and to the fallen angels what people in right relationship with him can do. If scripture is allowed to be its own interpreter, then the sons of Elohim mentioned in Genesis 6 were fallen angels that left their heavenly estate to procreate with human women in an attempt to prevent the birth of the promised Messiah. This unholy union resulted in the rise of the Nephilim and was the catalyst for both the Great Flood and Yahuwah's command to destroy the post-flood Canaanites. Father Yahuwah's name is thus vindicated and the atheistic claim that he is a genocidal maniac is exposed for the egregious lie that it is. Yahuwah's long-suffering love for his creation surely knows no bounds. 
praise his matchless name now and forever. He who knows the end from the beginning is just and righteous in all his ways.